So back in February, the whole family extended all of us went to Colorado, went back to Colorado for a vacation. And that was around, um, Valentine's day. And also around Valentine's day was a really cool concert, right? It was all of these people that, you know, really educated me, you know, while I was a child that came together for a concert. And we're talking Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, Mary J. Blige, 50 Cent, Eminem. And it was such an epic event that they also decided to host a Super Bowl around it. So they, they did that too. There's a concert and then also people played football, which was awesome. But that's not the only interesting thing that happened on that weekend because the night before this awesome concert slash Super Bowl, uh, the United States of America banned the importation of avocados from Mexico. And so today we are going to uh, talk about Mexico and avocados and bans and avocado oil and what that all means for like us as soap makers in today's deep dive. And I will tell you more about all of that because I just said it was a deep dive. So you have to assume that I'm going to talk for a long time in just a minute. But before I do, hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things. And you are here for day 200 and something of 365 days of soap. I don't know which day this something is because I've had to re-record this three or four times at this point. A um, couple times I lost the um, footage. And then one time I just didn't like it. And then the most recent time, uh, none of my audio was recording. I hope this is it, but also because of all that, I have no idea what day this is going to be. I probably have already put it on the screen at least once. But yes, we are talking about avocados. We are doing a deep dive into avocados, avocado oil, uh, specifically avocado oil. So I definitely wanted to do one of our deep dives because it's been a very long time since we've done one of these guys and talk about all things avocado. So for those of you who may be new to the channel and don't know kind of what the structure and format is for these sorts of videos, we tend to start out with where the thing that we're talking about comes from, how it's grown, um, how much it produces, how we use it in soap, the controversies, and also, you know, substitutions and of course my final thoughts because it is my channel and I get to have my thoughts. So this is what we are doing. It's a lot of very interesting and fun information, although spoiler alert, the controversies are big. I don't think they are as big as cocoa butter, but they're definitely along the same lines. And so we will get into that you know, soon, but we have to start, you know, kind of where we always start and we talk about the history of avocados and avocado oils, where they come from, how much yield there is and all of the jazz. So let's go there, you know, first. Okay, so first up, uh, why is avocado? How old is it? Where is it produced? All of the jazz. Like everything that we've talked about so far, it's old. 
super old. Um, earliest signs of like actual cultivation and selling can be linked to the time period between 7,000 and 5,000 BC, which is a huge time period. And basically within South Central Mexico. And so it's an old tree. Uh, recent, in recent years, and by recent years, I mean in the last, you know, 2000-ish years, so the AD thing, they have found cool ways to sort of graft. So like the branches of one of the avocado plants, like a Patron avocado plant, along with a Criello avocado plant, the roots, to create essentially a superior avocado tree. And that avocado tree produces a crap ton of avocados every year. It's a very high yield uh, product to be sure. And just for the record, avocado is a fruit. The delicious green fleshy thing that we all know and love. It's a fruit. I'm sure you all knew that, but just in case you didn't, because when I first found that out in my life, I was like, really? Wow, fun information. And so it's a fruit. And so it's a relatively small tree, and even in its beginning stages, once it starts bearing fruit, which is around three years after it actually you know, grows or whatever, even a small tree will produce like up to 750 pounds of uh, avocados every year, which is pretty wild because considering the very small footprint that an avocado tree has, even fully grown, it's around 60 feet tall and it doesn't have a huge diameter. So that means that one avocado tree produces, you know, 750 pounds of, you know, avocado of the actual fruit every year, which yields seven metric tons per two and a half acres every single year. So it's a pretty high yield. And like talking about the, how we, we do with, when I look at it from my perspective, like how much coconut oil I consume, how much palm, how much olive, you know, whatever. Seven metric tons, 14,000 pounds, right? Maths are good on that. In two and a half acres, I maybe go through a thousand pounds of avocado oil a year. Now granted, this is the production of just the fruit. And so that's another thing to keep in mind. The extraction of the oil, which we will get into very, very soon, is different. So obviously you're not getting that full, you know, seven metric tons of avocado oil from two and a half acres of land, but it's still a very high yield. I think the most recent estimates I saw for the United States, as far as like how much avocados we consume, we ingest per person per year is something like 10 pounds, which is kind of a lot of avocado no jokes about millennials and their avocado toast and being unable to afford homes because um, I have a home and it had nothing to do with my affinity for avocado toast. Still love that stuff. There is a pretty substantial increase of the amount of avocados that we want to consume as human beings just in the last 15 years or so. And they've been so far completely able to keep up with the demand because as I said, the, the tree itself it's a pretty high yield tree and it has a pretty small footprint. So that's good. Something to keep in mind with avocado trees though, um, growing them from scratch from the little pits or whatever can be very, very hard. Cross pollination is next to impossible and they are definitely susceptible to all manner of like bacterial and fungal and viral infections, the trees themselves that can cause them to die. So you have to have a pretty great green thumb to grow them in the first place. But once they actually get like there and they're, you know, there established. Yes. That's the word I'm looking for. Once they're established, they're a fairly hardy crop that actually doesn't take a ton of work to, you know, keep alive. It takes a lot of work to actually harvest though, which we will talk about later. Now, where are avocados found? Well, by far the place where avocados are grown the most is in Mexico. And there are like certain specific regions within Mexico that they grow the best. And in those regions, actually, we will get more into that when we start talking about the controversies with avocado. But really within Mexico, there are five basic states that it grows really, really well. And those regions produce between 1.5 to 2 million metric tons of avocados every single year, which is a lot. 
but in comparison to like the next most densely avocado populated region, you get it, which would be the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic produces less than half a million tons of avocados every year for worldwide consumption. So Mexico is basically where it's at. And of course we do have offshoots. You really do need a nice humid Mediterranean environment in order to grow and cultivate avocados and make sure that they thrive. And so there are places like California is a great example of that. You guys have heard of California avocados. Still does not hold a candle to the amount of avocados that are produced in Mexico with the United States coming in at, I don't know, let's see, not even on this list. So the top five countries that produce avocados are Mexico at 1.52 million tons, the Dominican Republic at 0.42 million tons, Peru at 0.35 million tons, Indonesia at 0.31 million tons, and Colombia at 0.28 million tons. United States isn't even on the list. We will talk about the United States later as sort of maybe a solution to the controversy, but any time that we propose a solution that of course does not come without its own, you know, costs. So that comes later. So it is safe to assume that the majority of avocados come from Mexico. And Mexico has a very long and sordid history of um, kind of underhanded business dealings when it comes to farmers and trade and things. And so we will be talking about that later, but it's safe to assume the majority of avocados that you see in your grocery store, they come from Mexico. Now, this is of course just the avocado, just the fruit. So where does the oil come from? Obviously it comes from the fruit, but how? How pressed, how expelled, how does that all work? And you know, how used? So let's go there next. Okay, so actually before we go on to how avocado oil is pressed from the avocado itself, we should talk about how avocados are harvested. And the short answer to that is it's long and is completely done by hand. And that's a lot. So yeah, it's a complete hand process, hand picked. And they don't pick the avocados when they're ripe. They obviously pick the avocados when they're very, very green, and then they're sent on to their various factories downtown where peaches come from. But yes, all handpicked while they're very, very green. And so you know those things that you can like, it's the pole with a little clipper attached and you can clip smallish branches from tallish trees. It's like that, except it has a little basket, like a little net attached to the clipper catch the avocados so they don't get bruised because we don't want them bruised and you have to do that. Now again, as I said, each of the trees are about 60 feet tall, which in general, not a huge tree, but also it's a big freaking tree, you know? And so, you know, ladders and people going up and using the little clippy clip things to drop the avocados and going back to like the yield of each tree. Okay. Let's say that each avocado is around a third of a pound, right? I think that's about an accurate weight representation. So what is that, like 2,500 individual avocados that are hand clipped from the tree? It's very arduous labor, sir. That's a lot. There, there's a lot that goes into that for sure. And again, it's ladders and people and it's a lot to harvest it. And there's not any other, like when we were talking about the olive oil thing, like there's little netting things and broomy machinery things that can sort of sweep the olives up into it. They don't do that with avocados. It's primarily hand-picked, which is pretty wild. That's, that's a lot of work. 2,000, 2,500 avocados per tree per year. Well, that's a lot of people up on ladders, clippy clipping and putting, it's a lot of work. So now that we know how avocados get off the tree, which is kind of a lot, uh, how do we get the avocado oil out of the avocados? Well, there's essentially three methods and that's where all of the different types and grades of avocado oil are going to come from. And we'll definitely talk more about that 
as we, you know, continue with all of this. But the methods that we do are, I would also like to point out that interestingly, avocados, they're one of the very few oils that you do not actually get the oil from the pit, from the seed itself, you're getting it from the flesh. And so that's interesting to note. So that first and foremost. So now we have expeller pressed, which again is high heat because of the friction. And uh, in some cases, like when that dude was uh, trying to mansplain beard oils to me and was telling me that heating the oils to like 120 degrees meant that all the beautiful things about the oils were gone. Ridiculous. And uh, avocado oil is one of the prime examples why that's ridiculous. High smoke point with avocado oil. So not a huge deal if there's extra added, you know, temperature to it because of friction. But, you know, because people are concerned about that, they have a secondary method, which is called, you know, cold press. And so no extra heat is involved in essentially squeezing, flattening to get all the oils out. Kind of over and over again. There's actually a third method which involves both cold press and the expeller method. So you, you press it, you, you spin it around, you press it, you spin it around to make sure you get everything out. And that again produces a different grade of avocado oil. But those are the three big ways of doing it. Not a ton of energy is actually consumed with doing really any of these. No more so than any other oil that, you know, we're talking about in the soap making world. But, you know, just something to keep in mind. It's nice to know how things become what they become, right? And again, we will talk about all the different grades and, you know, grade A, virgin, later when we're talking about how it's all used for our purposes. But for the most part, those are the three methods. The expeller press method, which produces natural heat due to friction, is one way. The cold press method, which produces no extra heat because pressing, is another way. And the third way actually does involve the introduction of heat and chemicals to ensure that essentially all oils are stripped away from the fats, the solids, of the avocado fruit itself, and so you get the most yield effectively. So. That's basically how that all works. So in reality, there's not actually a lot of difference between the way that we extract avocado oil, basically the same way that we extract oils from virtually almost any vegetable matter. So cool, we're all familiar with that. We've been around for the deep dives before, so that's awesome. And as far as the harvesting goes, um, also, reasonably similar. I mean, there's always going to be some sort of human intervention into all of these harvesting methods for sure. This one seems to be a little bit more actual human arduous as opposed to machinery based. And so I guess that's where one of the controversies lie. But next up, and I know that we're speeding through all of this, but um, the controversies are actually kind of big and there's like a lot of them. So we should probably get to that sooner rather than later. One of the controversies is actually the human interaction in all of it, which we will cover shortly. But first, let's kind of pick off the easier controversy and let's talk about the monarch butterflies. Okay, so controversy number one involves the monarch butterflies. And you know, we know what they are. We've seen them. They're beautiful. They're awesome butterflies. It's a butterfly. So we like them first and foremost. But just in case you don't know why you're supposed to like butterflies, uh, it's kind of like bees. If you if you like the, the, the honeybees or the bees and you want to save the bees, you also want to save the butterflies. You, you want these things to pollinate because they drop down, they do the thing thing, they bring the so it's a lot like the bees. Um, now with the monarch butterflies, it was like 1997 that it was kind of first reported that there was a very real decline in the amount of monarch butterflies that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife had like tracked and were recording. Now, how do they know that? That's an interesting question in and of itself. And we'll get into that further in just a couple minutes. But essentially, there are 
monarch butterflies that make this migration. Like it's like a 3000 mile migration from like Canada down to Mexico and, and like where they really settle to do their thing thing and the cocoony thing. And it's the best temperature for them to do the thing is in Michoacan, Michoacan, Michoacan. Honestly, I don't know. I had Google pronounce that for me and it still sounded wrong. But anyway, this is the same state that avocados are mostly produced and allowed to be, you know, exported from. More on that later. Anyway, this is part of the monarch butter butterfly's flight path. And then they make their journey back up north. So they complete a two-way journey over several generations in order to get back up to Canada and then, you know, complete the, the cycle. Again, pollinating as they go. And in like 1997, it was reported that there was a decrease in monarch butterfly population. And just a few years ago, like it got so bad that just a few years ago in 2020, a group of, you know, people that were studying the monarchs uh, found that there were less than 2000 of them making this migration from Canada to Mexico. And that's obviously very concerning. You only have 2000 butterflies on that flight path. How do we know and how do we track it? And it's all very confusing anyway, but obviously that was cause for alarm in 2020 where everything was cause for alarm and you know, rightly so. But on top of that, we had to throw in the, oh yeah, also PS, the, the monarch butterflies look like they're completely facing extinction. And um, that's problematic because of the aforementioned pollinating and all the things. And it was mostly since 1997, mostly tied to the decline of the monarch butterfly population was mostly tied to the avocado industry in Mexico, because in order to meet the demand, the worldwide demand of avocados, uh, people and farmers and cartels in Mexico were clear cutting things, trees, that were actually more beneficial for the monarchs to do their thing and that provided the nice coverage for milkweed and stuff to grow underneath and the right water drainage stuff in favor of the avocado plant and so because of all the clear cutting and everything the monarchs were effectively killed was kind of the running thing that was going on and that's a big deal that's a big deal obviously but like two months ago, I think in February of this year, it was reported that almost 300,000 monarch butterflies from the same group that reported there were less than 2,000 of them two years ago were being seen making the trek back up north. And so while that's still like in the grand scheme of like insect uh, population, that's still not a bunch, but that's a startling, you know, contrast, 2000 to like 300,000. It's a huge deal. Uh, do the avocado farmers have anything to do with the decline of the monarch butterfly? Sure. In as much as we all have to do with that. It's, it's just another example of this very interesting ecosystem. And I'll, of course, post links about the migration pattern of the monarch butterfly, as well as all the information that I'm sort of going off of to talk to you right now. But yeah, no, sure, they do have something to do with it. And as much as every like ecosystem supply and demand chain has to do with everything. If the demand goes up, the supply also has to go up and there are consequences to that. And so, you know, being better consumers, being aware of the issues, it's just like I always say, like, A, first and foremost, boycotts don't work. That doesn't actually fix the problem. Finding other avenues for getting your avocados, that is a good idea. But in reality, this is just another example of an ecosystem being impacted by our consumerist tendencies. But are the avocado farmers actually to blame? Well, I mean, no, I, I don't think realistically they are for this point. Um, it contributes to the problem, sure, 
but also our desire to have a lot of avocados also contributes to that problem. Another reason that we are experiencing problems with monarchs and their population has a lot to do with that whole 3,000 mile journey. And what's been going on in the state of California for, well, ever, but certainly in rapid fire for the last 15 years, mass wildfires that are taking out the areas that they would normally stop and do things. And so avocado farmers, I think, at the end of the day in Mexico are not 100% to blame for the monarch butterfly decline. I think we kind of all are as humans. And so again, make good choices, do the things. But to pin it on this one area, I don't think is very honest. So this is kind of the least of the concerns. It's a huge concern, which should tell you what the other ones are. Huge to the nth degree. But no, I, I think the population decline is kind of expected based on what's going on and not necessarily the avocado farmer's fault. That said, did they have a part to play in it? Yeah, for sure. But just in the last two years, we're finding out that it seems to be on the mend. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm just reporting the controversies. I have no actual real ideas or answers for any of that, but I do know that monarch butterflies seem to be on the rise. And so if you live in one of the flight paths of the monarch butterflies, the things that you can do to help is, you know, plant native milkweed in your area. Do that, help out in that way. And, you know, first and foremost, be informed. And, you know, while you might be glossing over with this whole thing, like, like literally, who cares? It's just a butterfly. They actually provide a very important, you know, piece of the ecosystem, depending on what you deem important. And so I will drop, of course, some links below as to how they impact the ecosystem outside of just being pollinators. And, you know, feel free to look over it. But again, I'm just reporting the controversies. And that's just one of a number of controversies surrounding avocados and therefore by extension avocado oil that we have. And so do keep that in mind. But now we're going to move on to the next controversy, which is uh, the reason why I kind of started this entire thing out with, oh yeah, also the night before the Super Bowl, one of the biggest avocado consuming days of the year in the United States, uh, avocados were not allowed to be um, brought into the United States anymore. So let's now go to the next controversy, which is cartels. Okay, so on to uh, the second and third biggest controversies. And I say second and third because the second uh, feathers into the third and the second is arguably the reason why there's a problem with the first and the third. And that is called Mexican cartels. Now, I mean, like, what's a cartel? Is it drugs? Is it guns? Is it just bad people doing bad things? Yeah, all of those things group of people that is looking to capitalize off of the backs, the literal backs of society around you to, you know, extort some sort of a profit. And that's messed up. Cartels, Mexico. Going back to what I kind of started this whole thing out with, with the Super Bowl and how the night before the Super Bowl, uh, it was announced that the United States was uh, banning any sort of importation of avocados from Michoacan. One of the reasons why it's interesting is A, again, the Super Bowl in the United States is one of the most popular days to consume mass quantities of avocado. Two, Mexico avocado, avocados from Mexico, whatever. The company, like the big company, had an ad in the Super Bowl that cost them like almost $2 million for a 30 second slot talking about like avocados from Mexico or whatever. So they'd already paid for the spot. And granted, like the actual avocado consumption on the Super Bowl didn't matter either because we already had the avocados in the country that would have been consumed on the Super Bowl. So whatever. Anyway, the US government issued 
a no importation of avocados from Mexico, from Michoacan. Sorry. The night before the Super Bowl, because one of the inspectors had been threatened. And, you know, on its face, it might not sound like that big of a deal, but here's the thing. This is not the first time that an agricultural inspector from the United States government had been threatened and or kidnapped and or otherwise harassed um, from Mexico and the avocado, you know, thing. And so, you know, we kind of issued a warning. Interesting, because... On its head, if the, from what I can tell, based on what I've read and what I've looked into or whatever, on its head, if the avocado farmers just had it their way, there would not be any of this threatening of United States, you know, federal government agencies happening. That's not to say that there haven't been problems. Here's the thing, uh, like back in like, 1914 or something, there was a ban issued on all avocados from Mexico to the United States because of the fear of, you know, pestilence. And it's a very fascinating process how we get, you know, foods and stuff across country lines or whatever. But it was basically determined that we're just not going to mess around with Mexico because you guys are not paying attention to the things that we obviously don't want to cross our borders and therefore infect the rest of our crops. Fine. That ban, which started in like, again, I think 1914, didn't end, wasn't lifted until 1997, which is also, interestingly, the same year that, you know, well, the year before, people started making comments about how the monarch population was declining. And we, at that point, only effectively allowed in the United States avocados to be imported from one particular state within Mexico. And it's Michoacan. I'm sorry. At that time, because of this, uh, avocados, which had been primarily just taken out of California. And so like roughly it was two pounds per like individual consumer consumption per year. It skyrocketed. And from 1997, it went from two pounds to 10 pounds per year per person. Huge demand. Like we can get them, we can get them in like bigger bulk. And uh, the cartels looked at that and went, well, I want a piece of that too. The problems with that are many. Like, you're already dealing with a foreign government, United States to Mexico, different governments, you know, whatever. And so how you handle your country is, you know, arguably your own business. But also, it's not just the government that's sort of setting different taxing things to make sure they get their piece of what ultimately became like a $3 billion a year industry. Avocados are big business in Mexico. But also, so did the cartels. They decided, well, hey, I want my money too. And so they effectively went to the farmers and said, all right, so you are g getting, let's say, $100 per, let's call it a bushel. None of these figures are actually accurate. I will give articles that are specifically talking about this, but just for ease of conversation here a hundred dollars per bushel or whatever of avocados. Uh, and that's what you're going to get paid. How about instead? How about instead? How about instead? Uh, you get $90 that you get to keep and 10 of that $100 you give to me. And that's going to be for your, your farm protection for, you know, whatever. They're ultimately still spending the exact same amount of money in terms of labor and, you know, production costs and whatever. But now we have this extra like insertion of we're going to take some of it. And so the best way that they could, uh, work their way around that, because like, do you say no to a cartel? Do you want to have that battle? I don't want to have that battle. So instead of saying no, they increased production 
which means clear cutting more land, which means uh, bringing in more people to help harvest the more land to keep their costs as low as they possibly can so they can still meet their contracts that they have with a lot of them with the United States, primarily the United States, and continue surviving while also still paying off the cartels. And so uh, it became this really big problematic thing within not only are the cartels directly involved in whether or not we get our avocados for our millennial avocado toast, but how is that achieved? And one of the decisions that the farmers kind of logically had to come to was, well, in order to make sure that we meet the demands and we can still like survive or whatever, is we have to start using more interesting ways of harvesting the avocados. And those ways came in the form of child labor, primarily. Again, as I said earlier in the video, this is not nearly as bad as the cocoa butter thing and how much that broke me, but it's still uh, bad. I think any time that a child doesn't have the ability to live and be a child is uh, horrible. But, you know, also I am saying that as an American citizen and an upper class American citizen at that. So I get to say stupid shit like that and not whatever. Anyway, point is it became a necessity thing, which is the number three problem. Yes, child labor is also involved in the production of avocados. And I don't like that. That doesn't sit well with me, like for sure. The ban that we gave the night before the Super Bowl, the United States gave to Mexico the night before the Super Bowl, was very much a temporary ban. I want to say within 10 days it was lifted. But again, it it was a ban because one of our government officials was threatened. Like threatened. Not by the farmers. By the cartel. I kind of go back to um, a message that I got from a sudzer that actually lives in Mexico and this was like nine, 10 months ago at this point. And they effectively laid out in their emails that it's, it's not the, the, the cutting down. It's not, it's not the cutting down. It's not the, um, re assigning of the, the plots of land for avocado production so much as it, as it is literally the cartels. That's hard. And it's like a very difficult thing to walk around. And so as us that use avocado oil within our soaps, we need to be aware of that. Like, of course, we need to be aware of the child labor. But we also need to be aware of why the child labor is occurring in the first place. And in this particular instance, uh, it's the cartel involvement. And we have to make our decisions based on that information as to whether or not we use avocado oil at all. Yeah, these controversies are bad. They are not at all fun. Nothing that I want to talk about at all. These are all sort of inconvenient truths that we don't want to really discuss. But, you know, if we're actually serious about doing the soaping thing and the reason that we're doing the soaping thing is to make an impact on the world, we should be aware of them. We should pay attention. I, of course, will give my final thoughts on all of this, you know, once we're done with the rest of it. But right now, just in case you don't go any further in the video, avocado oil can be easily lifted out. So don't mess with it. You don't have to. You honestly don't have to contribute to this. That said, let's talk about how we do use avocado oil, all the different grades, uh, what we use it for in soaps, and uh, the substitutions. So you can do what we all, I think, have the right to do and make those decisions on our own. So let's go to avocado oil and its uses in soap. It's time to talk about how we use it in soap. 
its fatty acid profiles, uh, the benefits to the skin, and what we can substitute avocado oil, you know, with, and just not have it in our recipes at all. So first up, topical use of avocado oil and its benefits on the skin. I mean, it's high in antioxidants, it's high in essential fatty acids, it's high in uh, vitamins, it's a good sunblock as well. It promotes skin elasticity, that's coming from the EFAs, really. It's good for antimicrobial issues, so it can help out with, with things like uh, psoriasis and sensitive skin and dry skin and that sort of thing. Uh, avocado oil is in of itself a an oil that is slow to penetrate and so what that means is it's kind of a long-lasting oil on the skin so left on its own it's going to give you essentially like a greasy oily thing but during that time it's allowed to absorb like I don't know 14 layers into your initial pretend skin layers because there's a lot of factors in in the layers of, of skin anyway so it's actually a very good oil even though it has a comedogenic rating of like three which is about neutral and would probably suggest that it's pore clogging while it can be i suppose given the right skin type it doesn't actually show any real signs of that being an issue. And so again, super good for the elasticity of the skin, for, for actually purging and balancing the skin's pH and the natural sunblock, which is good, and overall moisture, which is also good. So from a topical perspective, there's actually a lot of benefits. To avocado oil. Me personally, if I'm mixing this for a leave-on product for a cosmetic, I am still going to mix it with some oils that have lower comedogenic ratings to ensure that we have some fast penetrating oils as well as some slow penetrating oils and nothing really within the entire blend will be over a two comedogenic when it's all said and done. Now for hair uses, avocado oil is actually really pretty great, especially for the curly haired people in our world. So because it's a deep penetrating oil and the shaft of the hair follicle, when you have a, a textured hair, when you have a hair pattern that's, I would say 2C and above, but it allows for these really deep penetrating oils to actually penetrate really. And it helps out with frizziness, with tangling, with with breakage. But even for those that don't have a curly hair pattern, it's helping out with things like dandruff and eczema because it actually does help, again, balance the skin's pH. And so as an actual just direct leave-on, avocado oil has tons of benefits. Now, how do we use it in soap? Now, the way that we figure out how it's actually used in soap has everything to do with the fatty acid profiles. And we have talked about fatty acid profiles in every single deep dive, plus many, many other videos before, but that's really where this all works in, in the actual chemistry of soap making. The fatty acid profiles of insert oil here and how that actually is represented in the finished saponification soap thing. So really what we're looking at with avocado oil and its fatty acid profiles, we are looking at oleic, palmitic, and linoleic, right? Yeah, so about 45% uh, oleic, which is what you commonly find in olive oil, and then like 25% palmitic, which is what you commonly find in high quantities in like palm oil, or tallow, or lard, or cocoa butter. And then we have like 15% linoleic. Obviously for the oleic oils, the things that you're going to be looking at would be like olive oil, almond oil, canola oil. Uh, for your palmitic, you'd be looking at obviously your palm oil, your, your cocoa butters. And for the linoleic oils, you'd be looking at more lightweight oils like a sweet apricot oil or an argan oil, both kind of expensive. And so avocado oil, a direct substitution, 
uh, in all honesty, there's really no good substitution, like direct one-to-one -one ratio substitution for avocado oil in your formulations. Uh, almond oil comes kind of close, but again, because it kind of has reasonably significant amounts of oleic, palmitic, and linoleic, you're really looking at substituting two or three oils in place of avocado. That said, most people, because avocado oil is so damn expensive, they're only using it as like, you know, no more than 10% of your batch. And that's not to say that you have to. And obviously, because you've been doing these deep dives with me for a while, you already know that an upcoming video is going to be a soap using 100% avocado oil, because that's how we roll around here. So you're going to be able to compare that to the benefits of a 100% coconut or shea or palm or olive, you know, soap to see what the benefits actually are. But in reality, uh, olive oil is actually a pretty cool and special thing to put into your soap recipes. And if, if it weren't for the high price point, I would use it a whole lot more. Uh, the problems with that high price point though are real. Like, even if you need three extra oils to achieve your oleic, your palmitic, and your linoleic fatty acids, you're still looking at a cheaper price point. For me, the last time that I priced out avocado oil, it was something like, I don't know, 75 bucks for seven pounds. It's not inexpensive. So, you know, keep that in mind. But if you're in a place where you're avocado oil is cheaper, yeah, totally use it. Like use it a lot. And if you use it, decrease your olive oil and your palm oil or your lard or your tallow a lot because that's no longer needed. You can actually decrease that by quite a bit. And what that ultimate bar is going to yield is going to be a nice moisturizing bar that hardens reasonably quickly, has a nice hard bar, and has nice tiny tight bubbles to it. And all of the you know benefits of avocado oil imparting on its skin. Again, as we've talked about, I don't know. It's a rinse off product. And so technically speaking, because I want you guys to be responsible soap makers, it's a rinse off product. So don't ever say that it does anything. That doesn't mean that it does nothing though. So like, keep that in mind too. And like I said, we will be doing a 100% avocado oil recipe very, very soon. And you can see what that soap, you know, ultimately does because we like lather tests around here for sure. But for a leave on product, as far as like beard oils or skincare, like face oils or whatever go, lotions, um, anything 50% or under for avocado, I've never had any problems with. My end users have never had any problems with. So yeah, definitely play with it for your leave-ons. Technically speaking, especially in the way that we use avocado oil in soap making, therefore it's basically not necessary. Like you're kind of putting avocado in as almost label appeal than anything else. And so, yeah, no, you could totally just eliminate that from a recipe and just up the other oils that will contain some percentage of the oleic, the palmitic, or the linoleic acids and be just fine. So wrapping this all up, what does it all mean? Avocado, like every other oil and or butter that we have done a deep dive on so far, is problematic. Like it has a slew of benefits for sure, but all of those benefits are of course going to come with their own sets of consequences. And as I've said time and time and time again, it is ultimately up to you to decide what pros and cons you feel comfortable with. And if you don't feel comfortable with the cartel uh, basically extorting the avocado farmers or the avocado farmers as a result, if you have a problem with it, then don't use it. That's fine too. Uh, for my part, I do use it. Um, I have gone back to this whole thing of, again, boycotts don't actually fix anything ever. Uh, being responsible with the way that you purchase your products will help 
wildly more than a boycott and, um, you know, C, literally do whatever makes sense for your business. And as long as you are doing the right thing for your company and for the most amount of people, then you're doing the right thing. I, I don't think any of us are out there doing the, the bad thing. And so make the good decisions for your business. Oh, this sucks that I'm putting it at the end of all of this. But I said earlier that we would talk about the different grades of olive oil and what it all means. And the reason why I didn't spend a lot of time on that is because it doesn't mean much of anything. Just like within the coconut oil and the olive oil, the different grades are ultimately represented by how much chemical and or human interference has been done to extract the oil. The fatty acid profile and compositions are in the same, like the same, just like with the olive oil pomace and the grade A olive oil and, and all the things, much is the exact same with avocado oil. Like the, the fatty acid composition does not change. And so as far as which one you should buy, buy whichever one that fits within your business model, as well as whatever fits in your, you know, actual, you know, business money thing. It's a real term, business money thing. It doesn't actually matter. Uh, the comedogenic ratings, very like slight, not a real difference. Uh, the fatty acid profiles, not a real difference. The soaping, not a real difference. And so it kind of goes back to the olive oil thing. Can you get an avocado pomace? Technically speaking, yes, you can. It is wildly cheaper. And like the real reason for that is it's kind of the remnants and the dregs, like the last squeeze, the last press of avocados. But compositionally, there's no difference. And when we're making soap, that's really all we have to go off of is the compositional difference. And if the fatty acid profile has not changed as a result of any of that, then there's really nothing for you to super worry about. That said, if you're the type of person that worries about things like, you know, rogue chemicals still existing in your oils and all that jazz, then I mean, yeah, worry about them and go for like an extra virgin avocado oil versus like a pomace. That's fine. Do your thing. Have fun. But yeah, like ultimately at the end of all of this, it does really come back to exactly what I've said with everything. You make your own choices, you do your own thing, and none of it is necessarily wrong. We want to give people nice skincare products that make their skin feel good. And as long as we're not like borking a recipe, then yeah, we're achieving that. And whatever decisions you make within your business, be it, I don't want to do any animal byproducts, or I don't want to do something that hurts other animals, or I don't want to do anything involving child. That's great. That's awesome. And you are well within your rights to do that. And there's nothing wrong with it. Just don't jump on other people's back if they decide to do something different. So just try to keep that in mind before you guys start getting weird on the forums and shit and going, this is better because X or thus is better because Y. Like literally just shut up and just don't do that. There's your soaps are awesome because you made them and your customer base likes them. Their soaps are awesome because they made them and their customer base likes them. And we all get to be here in this little environment here at Soap and Clay as the Sudzer family and understand that we don't pass judgment on other people and the decisions that they make for their business. And if you ever catch me passing judgment on the decisions that people make for their business, you know, call me out. Yes, this has been the first deep dive in a long time and it's completely weird, but I'm gonna call it there. It's gonna be good and we're going to be awesome. And thank you for everybody who, you know, stuck with me through this whole thing, which will probably be a premiere and I'll be in the thing and, you know, chatting with you the entire time. And that'll be awesome and fun because one of my most favorite things to do is to talk to my Sudzers, but it still feels weird and awkward and uncomfortable and took longer than the last one did, mostly because I've been, you know, out of practice.
But the next deep dive is going to be on cornstarch, mostly because I'm going to get petty as shit. So all of the things that you just heard me say about unicorns and rainbows and blowing unicorn rainbow smoke up people's asses. I mean, I guess that's true, but also I also get a right to defend myself and call people out that are being actively dumb. And so that's what the cornstarch deep dive is going to be about. We have some very special guest appearances for that one, and I'm very much looking forward to that one. Yes. But for now, I got to go. I actually, it's, I don't know what day this actually ever gets published, but at this exact time of recording, it is three o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. I have to go get my kidlets. We're going to the movies tonight. It's going to be very exciting. So a big special thank you to my sudsers. Thank you very much for existing and being you and being awesome and all the things every day that I get to do this with you. It's pretty freaking cool. And I hope you guys look forward to, you know, all of the soapy things at all times. So thank you for joining me for another round of 365 days of soap. This has been the longest outro I've ever had ever, but you know, thanks for sticking with me for that too. I will see you guys all again tomorrow for another round of soapy fun. Bye.